Hello, I'm Dr. Tony Talibi, and we're back with Dr. Jonathan Strasberg. Now we're going to discuss the management of gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. All right, so let's take a step back. Let's assume a patient has had a mass in the pancreas, and they've had a biopsied, and it's come back positive for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. What happens next for that patient? Well, uh, you'll want to do a good history and physical, uh, find out what symptoms a patient is having, find out if they're having any hormonal related symptoms, high blood sugar, low blood sugar, mm -hmm. unusual rash, diarrhea, heartburn, um, and then, uh, you know, lab tests based on that. Uh, imaging studies, we would generally get a three-phase CT scan of the abdomen. Uh, three-phase really is more sensitive than a standard uh, uh, contrasted CT scan for imaging liver metastasis, which can usually mm -hmm. be better Im Im imaged on the arterial or venous phases. Um, MRIs can also be quite sensitive, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, an Octrea scan, also for looking at the entire body for somatostatin receptor expressing uh, tumors. I see. <clears throat> so there's a term called staging. What does that mean? Staging basically implies uh, trying to assess the extent of disease. Has the cancer spread outside of its primary site? I see. So now let's, let's discuss the situation in which you do the full workup and the tumor is localized in one area. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Usually that's a surgically curable situation and we would refer the patient uh, to the surgeon to, uh, to see about resection. I see. Now, are there still scenarios where you would refer the patient to the surgeon if, if, there, if there is spread to other parts? With neuroendocrine tumors, we uh, not uncommonly uh, perform surgical metastatectomies. In other words, in patients where we think we can get all or nearly all metastases, mm -hmm. either resected or ablated, we'll often send patients uh, to surgeons for that. And that usually involves the liver because that's where uh, gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors usually spread. I see. So you, you mentioned ablation. What is radiofrequency ablation? It uh, basically involves insertion of a probe uh, uh, with microwave energy used to burn a uh, tumor with the surrounding margin. It's usually effective for for sort of uh, solitary tumors smaller than three to five centimeters. And when would you choose that over surgery? Uh, in cases where the tumor is difficult to resect surgically or in a case for example where this patient has primarily disease in the right lobe but maybe one tumor in the left lobe We'll do a right hepatectomy and radiofrequency ablation of the left uh, lobe tumor. Very nice. What about hepatic artery embolization? Do you ever use that? Quite frequently. Uh, basically, uh, it's a liver-directed therapy. It relies on the fact that uh, uh, the liver has two uh, blood supplies, mm -hmm. the hepatic mm -hmm. artery, which uh, the metastases primarily rely on, as well as the portal vein, which mostly supplies the normal liver parenchyma. And so by blocking uh, arterial supply, we can selectively kill tumor cells. I see. So the one question that patients always ask their doctor is, you know, doctor, can you please surgically take everything out? Right. At which point do you say, no, let's just start other treatments? Well, it's a subjective judgment, um, but when we're talking about fairly scattered tumors in both lobes of the liver, mm -hmm. those are not usually situations where uh, surgery is beneficial and we have to think of other uh, therapies such as hepatic artery embolization. I see. But I, I think especially with this type of tumor, at least a second opinion at a university hospital would be recommended, no? I would absolutely recommend that, yes. I see. So now let's take the scenario where the tumor is too far spread and surgery is definitely not an option, even by a, a university surgeon. What happens next? Well, there's, you know, it really depends on the extent of disease. Are we just talking about liver metastases? Or are we talking about more widespread disease? Uh, for most neuroendocrine tumors, actually, the first uh, uh, line of therapy involves a somatostatin analog, mm -hmm. such as octreotide. Um, initially, these drugs are developed to control the hormonal syndromes. Octreotide was found to be very effective at controlling the carcinoid syndrome and some other syndromes associated with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. But it was later found that octreotide can also inhibit tumor growth. This mm -hmm. is called the anti-proliferative effect of octreotide. It was proven several years ago in a phase three study called the PROMIT study, where 30 milligrams of octreotide LAR was compared to placebo, and the median time to progression increased from about six months to about 14 months mm. uh, between the uh, placebo and experimental arm. So 
we tend to use octreotide quite frequently, primarily in mid-gut carcinoid tumors, but we also think this effect holds for other well-differentiated uh, neuroendocrine tumors. I see. So e l let's, uh, let's discuss again, what is a functional versus non-functional tumor for our patients? Functional means hormone producing. So a tumor that produces hormone that leads to a clinical syndrome would be considered a functional tumor. And octreotide tends to palliate most of the functional syndromes associated with neuroendocrine tumors. I see. So even if a, even if a tumor does, is not causing any symptoms, would you still use octreotide for that patient? I would, uh, based on the data that octreotide can inhibit tumor growth. I see. Now, now, what is an octreal scan? And there's actually a treatment that, that can be used with a, following an octreal scan. What is that? Octreal scan is a, a radio, involves a radioisotope, indium-111, conjugated to octreotide, mm -hmm. and basically images some metastatin receptor expressing tumors. Mm -hmm. It's likely that tumors that are positive on octreal scan will be more sensitive to treatment with, mm -hmm. with octreotide. And we know that, it's, uh, that they're more sensitive to treatment with a new class of drugs called somatostatin uh, analog radio-labeled antibody, um, uh, sorry, somatostatin analog uh, radio-labeled compounds, mm. such as lutetium or yttrium, mm -hmm. uh, labeled to octreotide or octreotate. That basically enables delivery of radioactive isotopes directly to somatostatin receptor expressing tumors. And how is that treatment rendered? What does a patient have to do? Well, basically, uh, they need to have relatively strong uptake um, on octreal scan, indicating that they're expressing these somatostatin receptors. And basically, they're injected with um, uh, either lutetium-177 or yttrium-90, conjugated to a somatostatin analog. Uh, it involves a infusion once every two months, usually for about uh, three or four treatments, um, at which point they usually achieve, you know, uh, achieve maximal uh, tolerable radiation dose. Uh, what are some potential side effects of that treatment? Well, for most patients, it's surprisingly well tolerated. Some patients have a little bit of acute nausea and vomiting. Uh, yttrium seems to be a little bit more nephrotoxic than lutetium, so there are cases of uh, renal insufficiency. Uh, both um, uh, compounds can cause bone marrow toxicity, which is a main dose-limiting event. So cytopenias, uh, there have been rare cases of myelodysplastic syndrome. So the cytopenias mean low cell counts, white blood Correct. cells. I see. Interesting. Um, what about sometimes carcinoid can affect the heart valve? What, what is that? So in addition to causing uh, flushing and diarrhea, uh, serotonin can directly impact um, cardiac valves, especially in the right side of the heart, tricuspid and pulmonary valves. Those are the valves that are exposed to serotonin produced by liver mm -hmm. metastases. It causes fibrosis and thickening of the valves, which usually leads to severe tricuspid regurgitation and uh, pulmonic stenosis or regurgitation, eventually right-sided heart failure. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it relatively infrequently in about 10% of patients with carcinoid syndrome, um, and usually patients with very severe, uh, long-standing elevations of uh, serotonin. I see. So that's, uh, checking an echo and ultrasound of the heart is not something you would routinely perform? I don't routinely perform it. I perform it in patients who are at risk for it and uh, who have physical findings or symptoms uh, suggestive of early right-sided failure, or in patients who are at risk who are going to surgery. And what are some of these symptoms? Uh, basically right-sided heart failure, so leg swelling. Um, leg swelling is usually the first manifestation, mm -hmm. progression to dyspnea and exertion, eventually orthopnea. I mean shortness of breath or shortness or of breath, breath or laying flat. Exactly. Yeah, I see. Now, when would you resort to chemotherapy in this disease? Well, we know that uh, poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which are really a very different category, mm -hmm. are very sensitive to uh, platinum etoposide chemotherapy. So these are very aggressive cancers that respond mm -hmm. to the same kind of chemotherapy we use mm -hmm. in small cell lung cancer. Mm -hmm. We've also found out that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors tend to be much more sensitive to chemotherapy than mm. intestinal carcinoid tumors, uh, particularly uh, streptozosin or temozolomide-based chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so when would you actually escalate from octreotide to chemotherapy? What, what would lead you to that? For metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, actually, for me, in my practice, chemotherapy is often the second-line therapy mm -hmm. after somatostatin analogs. Uh, we found very high response rates with a combination of uh, uh, capecitabine and temozolomide. Um, others uh, will try other targeted agents, 
uh, and reserve chemotherapy for later line of therapy or for more aggressive, faster growing tumors. I see. So basically, if the tumor is growing on part of the workup you've done, then you go to chemotherapy. Correct. There is a variety of nowadays of uh, um, available agents for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, mm -hmm. uh, much more than there were a few years ago, uh, but uh, we really don't know how best to sequence them. I see. And do you continue the octreotide injections when you escalate to chemotherapy, or do you abandon that? It really depends. If the patient has a hormonal syndrome, I usually continue it. Uh, if the patient does not, and there's clear growth on, uh, on octreotide, I'll usually stop the octreotide. I see. And so how do you, let's say if you do start chemotherapy, how do you follow your patients to see whether they're responding? Do you check lab work, CAT scans? Usually CAT scans mm -hmm. every uh, three months. Uh, we check tumor markers like chromogranin A or pancreatic polypeptide as well. And what are some side effects that your patients might experience with the chemotherapy? It really depends on the type of chemotherapy. Uh, we found that temozolomide-based chemotherapy is relatively tolerable. The main um, uh, toxicities are low blood counts, especially low platelet count, mm -hmm. which can increase the risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, nausea, usually well controlled if patients take appropriate uh, anti-nausea medications. And tiredness, but you know, it really varies quite a bit from mm -hmm. patient to patient. What about the streptozosin? Streptozosin tends to be a little bit more toxic for most patients. It also causes low blood counts, uh, mm -hmm. nausea, tiredness. And it's usually used in combination with either five of you, uh, adriamycin or, or both together. But nowadays these are things that we can manage quite readily and easily, yes? Correct. I mean, nausea is not nearly as big a problem as it used to be mm -hmm. with modern uh, anti-nausea medicines. I see. And let's shift focus to the molecularly targeted agents and newer agents. What is sunitinib sutans and how do you use it and when do you use it? So sunitinib is a uh, oral medication that targets the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor as well as some other receptors. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors happen to be very vascular and so mm. quite sensitive to this form of therapy. Uh, it's been proven to be effective in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where the median time to tumor growth increased from about 5 months on placebo to about 11 months uh, with sunitinib. The response rates are relatively low but it clearly improves time to progression. So you would use this after chemotherapy? Well. You know, there's a, when it comes to sequencing, there's no consensus, mm -hmm. and uh, we could use it before or after chemotherapy, and in a sense, there's, uh, there's trial and error. It's very hard to predict which patient will respond to what form of therapy. I see. And what are some usual side effects that you've seen with the sutin? Sutin can cause nausea, diarrhea, tiredness. It can cause uh, something called hand-foot syndrome, which is a painful rash in the palms and soles. It can raise the blood pressure, mm -hmm. lower blood counts a little bit. So it's not chemotherapy, but um, uh, in many ways it can be just as uh, toxic in terms of side effects. This is the problem, this is the, what I struggle with is with the hand-foot syndrome, and many patients struggle with that. What have you found to be the best alleviating agent? Um, you know, usually just reducing the dose. There are various creams, there's uh, utter cream, uh, bag balm, things like that that some patients find helpful. I see, okay. Now what about, <clears throat> there's another agent called the mTOR inhibitors. Correct. What are those? So mTOR inhibitors like Everolimus, Affinitor, um, inhibit an enzyme called melotargetor rapamycin, mTOR. It's a very central enzyme that um, uh, directs tumor proliferation and growth. Mm -hmm. um, it was also tested in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and the results of the trial were virtually identical to the sunitinib trial. Mm. In other words, improvement in progression-free survival from about five months on placebo to about 11 months with Everolimus. I see. And what are some side effects you see with the Everolimus? Most patients get canker sores in their mouth. Mm. Uh, other side effects include skin rash, uh, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, decreased blood counts. I see. What about infections? Have you seen increased risk of infections with this agent? Uh, yes, we have. Um, it, it can cause, well, it, it, it belongs to a class of drugs, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that originated as immunosuppressants. Uh, the rate of infections is not that high, but mm -hmm. I've seen some cases of cellulitis and one or two atypical infections like fungal uh, pneumonia. I see. So just the doctor has to have a higher threshold for checking for unusual infections. Correct. I see. And, and the patient should tell the doctor if something is unusual. Correct. For example, fevers. I see. Now, what about, what is an MIBG? So, MIBG basically is a, um, 
uh, epinephrine or epinephrine catecholamine uh, transporter. Um, so it involves it's involved in amine uptake uh, mm -hmm. and decarboxylation, and uh, many neuroendocrine tumors have expression of uh, MIBG. And is there any treatment that can be used? Well, there's a radioactive form of MIBG mm -hmm. where uh, using uh, radioactive iodine. We, we almost never use that. It's primarily used for uh, uh, pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, which are neuroendocrine tumors of the uh, adrenal um, um, medulla and uh, uh, ganglion chains. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rarely used uh, uh, for carcinoid tumors okay, so for, that are positive on MIBG scan. I see. I got you. Now, you know, oftentimes our patients like to take herbal medicines. That's their way of having some sort of control over their disease. What do you tell your patients regarding herbal medicines? Well, uh, what I tell them is that I personally have very little information on them. Most of the data is uh, not based on high level of evidence. Um, I presume that most of them are harmless, but I can't say that for sure. Mm -hmm. And patients just need to use their discretion. But at the very least, you would like to know what, what they're taking, yes? I'd like to know, but uh, truthfully, there's very little I can do with that information because there's thousands of products out yeah, there, yeah. and it's impossible for a medical oncologist or any other physician to, uh, you know, be familiar with the details of potential side effects, especially when those drugs have, or, 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 or medicines um, have not really been tested sure. rigorously. Now, how do you deal with depression in your patients? Well, it's not uncommon for patients to be anxious or depressed related to their diagnosis, mm -hmm. but it's important to, um, you know, ask questions about mood, appetite, sleep, and get at the diagnosis of, of, of depression if one exists. Um, I'm usually comfortable prescribing antidepressant medications, but if it's mm -hmm. a complicated case, we have uh, both uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who can help patients deal with these issues. I see. You know, sometimes, as you know, family members ask us not to discuss the diagnosis with the patient. How do you handle that scenario? Actually, that, that's quite rare in my experience. I, uh, I don't see that a lot uh, when that happens. Um, I, I let the family members know that, that I at least have to offer the patient the right to know about their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. If the patient prefers not to know about it, then I'll, I'll res of course I'll respect that. I see, very good. And I think, <clears throat> in my experience, what patients want from us is hope. How do you instill hope in your patients? Well, with many neuroendocrine tumors, it's actually uh, uh, something we're able to do because we can reassure patients that, mm -hmm. unlike m many other cancers, uh, even if it's not curable, they could potentially live for many years with their diagnosis, uh, sometimes even for decades. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always the case, though, and we, you know, it's, it's always important to try to emphasize emphasize the positive, mm -hmm. even in difficult cases. Um, because even if the median survivals are short, in some cases there's, there's patients who, who do much better than average. That's so you, you have to sort of mix reality, um, you know, what the average outcomes are with the potential that some patients do better than that. I see. Well, thank you so much. Sure. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.